on World News Tonight. Asia's forgotten war? Two years on, the UN says the Myanmar coup is still committing crimes against humanity. Global growth. The IMF signals an upward growth forecast with China loosening COVID restrictions. Calls for peace. Blinken in Ramallah presses for a two-state solution appealing for an end to resurgent violence. An experiencing art. Argentines stepped into the world of Frida Kahlo for an immersive art experience. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening to all our viewers on the start of a new month. Thank you very much for joining us on World News. Now, leading tonight is the major hit on Adani. India's Gautam Adani has lost his title of Asia's richest person today as a rout in his conglomerate stocks deepened to $74 billion after a short seller report. A report by Hindenburg Research last week alleged improper use of offshore tax havens while flagging concerns about high debt and the valuation of seven listed Adani companies. It has brought heightened scrutiny of the conglomerate with an Australian regulator saying on Wednesday that it would be reviewing the allegations to see if further inquiries are warranted. The Adani Group has denied the allegations, calling them baseless and saying it has always made necessary regulatory disclosures. Today's stock losses saw Gautam Adani slip to 10th on Forbes' rich list with an estimated $84.1 billion just below rival Mukesh Abani, the chairman of Reliance Industries Limited, who has an estimated of $84.4 billion. Before the Hindenburg report, Adani had ranked third. The worsening rout comes despite the group managing of master support from investors to haul a share sale for flagship firm Adani Enterprises Limited over the line on Tuesday. Adani Total Gas, a joint venture between France's energy major Total and Adani Group, has been the biggest casualty of the short seller report, losing about $27 billion. Data also showed that foreign investors sold a net $1.5 billion worth of Indian equities since the Hindenburg report, the biggest outflow over four consecutive days since September 30th. Hindenburg said in a report it had shorted U.S. bonds and non-Indian trader derivatives of the Adani Group. Now, UK braces for a large-scale protest as up to half a million British teachers, civil servants, train drivers and university lecturers are expected to strike in the largest coordinated action in a generation, which the government says will cause widespread disruption. Lucy Preston teaches English at a school in London, only three days a week, as she can't afford childcare every day. She moonlights as a tutor in the evenings to make ends meet. The single mother of two is one of more than 120,000 teachers across England and Wales going on strike on Wednesday to demand higher pay. The mass walkout comes after last-minute talks with the education secretary broke down. Most state school teachers got a 5% pay rise in 2022, but the main union says it's not been enough, as four decades high inflation, still above 10% in December, meant their real-term incomes fell much more than that. According to the Trades Union Congress, half a million workers across different sectors are joining what's set to be the biggest strike in Britain in more than a decade. Firefighters also voted to walk out for the first time in over 20 years, after experiencing what their union says a 12% drop in real-term salaries. And an end to industrial action is nowhere in sight. Thousands of ambulance workers plan to carry out a fresh strike on February the 10th, while border officers at Channel Ports will stage a four-day stoppage during the half-term school holiday later in the month. The United States is readying more than $2 billion worth of military aid for Ukraine that is expected to include longer-range rockets for the first time as well as other munitions and weapons. Two US officials briefed on the matter had reported. The aid is expected to be announced as soon as this week, the officials said. It's also expected to include support equipment for Patriot air defense systems, precision-guided munitions and Javelin anti-tank weapons. One of the officials said a portion of the package expected to be $1.725 billion would come from a fund known as the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which allows President Joe Biden's administration to get weapons from industry rather than from U.S. weapon stocks. So far, the U.S. has sent approximately $27.2 billion worth of security assistance to Ukraine since Russia's February 2022 invasion. 
Now, exactly two years after the military junta seized power in a bloody coup, the world looks away from the country's descent into power. Protests were held in many nations today, decrying the military coup. Protesters mark the two-year anniversary of Myanmar's military coup with a silent strike in major cities and rallies overseas today as exiled civilian leaders vow to end what they call the army's illegal power grab. The Southeast Asian country's top generals led a push on February 2021 after five years of tense power sharing under a quasi-civilian political system created by the military. The United States and its allies have imposed further sanctions on Myanmar's military rulers amid deepening conflict two years since the military seized power. The junta ousted democratically elected leader Aung San Suu Kyi, who was later sentenced to 33 years in jail during secretive trials, cracked down on anti-coup protesters, arrested journalists and political prisoners, and executed several leading pro-democracy activists, drawing condemnation from the United Nations and rights groups. Two years on, the Southeast Asian country is being rocked by violence and instability. The economy has collapsed with shortages of food, fuel and other basic supplies. The Assistance Association of Political Prisoners, a human rights group, estimates that 13,680 people are currently detained for their support for the pro-democracy movement since the coup and that more than 2,800 people have been killed in the violence. The junta disputes the reported numbers of casualties. Now, the International Monetary Fund had marginally upgraded its forecast of global growth from October last year and according to its chief economist, Pierre Olivier Gorinchas, the Chinese economy will outpace global growth following its nationwide loosening of COVID-19 restrictions. The global economic outlook for 2023 is less gloomy as the IMF's latest update on its world economic outlook report showed that the global growth is projected to fall from an estimated 3.4% in 2022 to 2.9% 2 in 2023, then rise to 3.1% in 2024. The prospects for China in 2023 are far more optimistic. The IMF said that the Chinese economy will outplace global growth after slipping below it for the first time in four decades last year. According to the report, China's economy will grow by 5.2% in 2023, 0.8% points higher than the October 2022 forecast. Singapore and its ASEAN neighbours will definitely benefit from China's reopening this year. However, that will not be enough to outweigh the impact of slowing growth in other parts of the world. Based on the trajectory of their other major trading partners such as the US and Europe, the IMF has downgraded the growth figures for ASEAN 5, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore and Thailand, which are expected to slow to 4.3% this year. The IMF said in a newly released update to its World Economic Outlook report that growth in China is projected to rise to 5.2% in 2023, reflecting rapidly improving mobility. Yang Jiangping, the Director of Research Center for Regional Economic Cooperation under the Research Institute of Ministry of Commerce, stated that China's economy will be an important locomotive to promoting global economic growth in 2023. He said, as a developing country, China is not only motivated by consumer demand, but also driven by the huge demand in infrastructure construction and investment in fixed assets. For advanced economies, the slowdown will be more pronounced, with 9 out of 10 advanced economies likely decelerating, according to the report. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, China is bringing back mandatory COVID-19 tests on all travelers arriving from South Korea. The move is seen as a direct response to Seoul's extension of visa issuance restrictions for visitors from China. China abolished antivirus measures, including PCR testing for inbound travelers in early January. But there has been a policy U-turn for those arriving from South Korea. Starting Wednesday, all travelers coming from South Korea have to take a PCR test upon arrival. Anyone who tests positive will be isolated or quarantined at home or at a designated facility. Regrettably, some countries still insist on adopting discriminatory entry restrictions against China. China firmly opposes this and has a reason to take necessary reciprocal measures. Beijing's latest tit-for-tat move appears to be in retaliation for a decision by Seoul to continue its recently implemented policy to stop issuing visas for Chinese travelers wishing to come to Korea. 
The South Korean government announced last week that the visa restrictions, which were supposed to last until the end of January, would be extended for another month. However, Seoul has also said the measure could be lifted depending on the virus situation. We will review whether we can lift the visa restrictions earlier, even before February 28th. The quarrel between South Korea and China began in January as China decided to suspend its short-term visa services for South Koreans in retaliation for strengthened antivirus measures put in place by Seoul for inbound travelers from China as COVID-19 cases surged there. Although the short-term visa restrictions for South Koreans are still in place, Japan, which had been subject to similar retaliatory measures from China, saw visa issuance resume earlier this week. Seoul's foreign ministry official has reiterated that entry restrictions should never be based on factors other than to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken shuttled from Israel to the West Bank, which is currently functioning as the de facto state of Palestine, appealing for an end to resurgent violence and reaffirming Washington's backing for a two-state solution to the decades-long conflict. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken continued his Mideast tour on Tuesday in the West Bank, meeting with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, affirming Washington's support for a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and warning that Palestinians are facing what he called a shrinking horizon of hope for their future. Uh, it's also important to continue to strive uh, not only for reducing violence, but ensuring that uh, ultimately, uh, Israelis and Palestinians alike enjoy the same rights, uh, the same opportunities. Uh, what, we're, what we're seeing now for Palestinians is a shrinking horizon of hope, not an expanding one. And that, too, we believe needs to change. The Palestinian Authority leader said he was committed to work with Washington and the international community to return to dialogue in an effort to end what he called the Israeli occupation on the land of the state of Palestine based on the 1967 borders, with East Jerusalem as the Palestinian state's capital. These are protests in Ramallah and Gaza over Blinken's visit. Blinken crossed into the West Bank after meeting with Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant earlier that day and met Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a day before. The balancing act that the Secretary of State has managed here comes during the bloodiest month between Israelis and Palestinians since 2015. It includes at least 35 Palestinians killed in clashes with Israeli forces and the attack by a Palestinian gunman outside a synagogue last week. The Palestinian Authority also last week suspended its security cooperation with Israel, a response to an incursion by Israeli forces said to be the largest in years. Blinken is calling for calm from both sides. A video released by the New York State Attorney General's office shows former U.S. President Donald Trump repeatedly invoked his Fifth Amendment right when questioned about his family's business practices during a civil investigation last summer. I declined to answer the question. Same answer. Same answer. Video released Tuesday shows former President Donald Trump repeatedly invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination when questioned about his family's business practices during a civil investigation last summer. Anyone in my position not taking the Fifth Amendment would be a fool, an absolute fool. Over and over, Trump declined to answer questions before New York State Attorney General Letitia James, who was leading a civil investigation into the Trump Organization. James says her probe has uncovered significant evidence that the Trump Organization gave banks and tax authorities misleading financial information. Trump has denied any wrongdoing and, in the deposition, sought to portray James's investigation as part of a long-standing vendetta against him. The United States Constitution exists for this very purpose, and I will utilize it to the fullest extent and defend myself against this malicious attack by this administration, this attorney general's office, and all other attacks on my family, my business, and our country. Accordingly, under the advice of my counsel and for all of the above reasons, I respectfully decline to answer the questions under the rights and privileges afforded to every citizen under the United States Constitution. This will be my answer to any further questions.
On the same day the video was released, James asked a judge to sanction the former president, his adult children, the Trump Organization, and their lawyers over their responses to her $250 million civil fraud lawsuit against them. The defendants last Thursday filed formal answers in which they denied or claimed to lack sufficient knowledge about dozens of substantive accusations. In a letter to the Manhattan judge overseeing the case, James said many of their responses were demonstrably false. Lawyers for the Trump defendants did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Now, an ice storm is gripping areas in the U.S. Weather warnings were issued from Texas to Tennessee. The storm has brought air and ground travel to a virtual stop, with at least two people reported dead so far. Tonight, an icy mess gripping the southern plains, freezing nearly everything in its path. That's uh, solid ice at my walkway there. The frigid mix of rain and sleet putting 31 million Americans under winter weather alerts. The storm killing two people in Texas after icy collisions in Austin and Arlington. Many roads in Texas will remain very dangerous for the next 24 to 48 hours. The Texas governor adding any outages stem from ice buildup and not a failing power grid. Across the state, highways turned into skating rinks, causing hundreds of accidents and leaving some, like this Dallas transit bus, stranded in the cold. The driver, like so many others, stuck till reinforcements could arrive. Sand trucks working overtime as precipitation froze on contact. At airports, more than 1,900 cancellations nationwide with another 4,000 delays. The FAA saying conditions may not improve till Thursday. While in Arkansas, where a state of emergency was declared, these frozen power lines toppled over, catching fire. It's coming down. Pretty good. The roads are already solid white. Solid white and solid ice. One semi losing control so badly, cranes had to remove it in pieces as traffic backed up on a blocked I-40 for more than 15 miles. Tonight, with warmer weather days away, the polar threat remains far from over. There was a huge relief in Australia today as authorities say they have finally found the tiny radioactive capsule which went missing last month. Emergency services said they had literally found the needle in the haystack. A huge search was triggered when the object was lost while being transported along a 1,400-kilometer route across the state. Authorities released a close-up picture of the pea-sized capsule which could cause serious harm if handled on the ground among tiny pebbles. A unique serial number enabled them to verify they had found the capsule they were searching for. Mining giant Rio Tinto apologized for losing the device, which is 6mm in diameter and 8mm long. More than half a century since the original jumbo jet ushered in a glamorous new jet age, helping bring affordable air travel to millions of passengers, the last ever Boeing 747 was delivered, marking the start of the final chapter for the much-loved aeroplane. Pan Am introduces the incredible, the plane that's a ship, the ship that's a plane, the Boeing 747 Superjet. First when Pan Am started flying the 747 in 1969, it was billed as a luxury ocean liner above the clouds. With two floors and four engines, it has carried millions of travelers in its more than five decades as the queen of the skies. With the 747, Boeing revolutionized air travel. The jumbo jet more than doubled plane capacity to 500 seats and helped make flying affordable to the masses. Why? But the 747's legacy was not limited to commercial air travel. Used by NASA to carry the space shuttle, Boeing's jumbo jet has been chartered for more than one pope and has also served as the mode of travel for more than six U.S. presidents, known worldwide as Air Force One. Boeing never planned to keep the 747 in service for so long. The company was convinced supersonic jets like the Concorde would overtake commercial air travel, and Boeing planned to transition the 747 to carrying freight. But for decades, the plane with its iconic hump endured. Now it's being phased out to make room for more efficient dual-engine planes like the 737 MAX. The 747 was built to last, 
and will continue to fly passengers for years to come. The last freighter version of the jumbo jet is being delivered to Atlas Air, marking the end of an aviation era. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Haas became the first Formula One team to show off their new look for 2023 with growing optimism for the season ahead and US-based MoneyGram now as prominent as a title sponsor. A green hue is due to pass by Earth for the first time in about 50,000 years. The celestial body will swing past the planet at a distance of some 42 million kilometers between February 1st and 2nd. NASA is said to observe the comet using the James Webb Telescope, which may provide a glimpse into the solar system's formation. A new museum is preparing to open an exhibit featuring some of the more recent dinosaur discoveries. The museum will also showcase Big Joe. The roughly 155 million year old specimen is an Allosaurus that's 95% intact. It's one of the most complete of its kind in the world. India's finance minister presented the government's last full budget in parliament before a general election due next year. That Prime Minister Narendra Modi is widely projected to win. Inter Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg warned that China was substantially building up its military and trying to assert its power in the region as he visited Japan to boost ties with Tokyo amid an increasingly tense security environment. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now we leave you tonight with Argentines stepping into the world of Frida Kahlo for an immersive art experience that allows viewers to take a closer look at one of the most iconic painters' lives and works. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.